Talktainment Radio Worldwide Sound. TalkTainmentRadio.com. We give you a reason to come. The world's greatest radio. We give you a reason to stay. Radio, the way it should be heard. You got the power. The views and opinions expressed are those of the host and guest and not necessarily those of TalkTainmentRadio.com, the management, the staff, or KE World Network, LLC. This is the Compensatory Concept with Mr. Neely Fuller, heard exclusively on TalkTainmentRadio.com, the world's greatest radio. Radio, the way it should be heard. And now, Mr. Neely Fuller. If you do not understand white supremacy, which is racism, what it is and how it works, everything else that you understand will only confuse you, only confuse you, only confuse you. This is the Compensatory Concept with Mr. Neely Fuller, Jr., heard exclusively on TalkTainmentRadio.com, radio the way it should be heard. Let's welcome in Mr. Neely Fuller. Uh, Mr. Fuller, how are you doing, sir? I'm still learning. All right. Mr. Fuller, um, before we get into what we're going to talk about, let us know how we can get your two definitive works on white supremacy and racism. Mr. Fuller. Go to ProduceJustice.com, and what will come up on the screen is a brief description of a basic book. It has a computer design on it called a textbook workbook for thought, speech, and or action for victims of white supremacy. And then there is a, an additional book called a Compensatory Counter-Racist Codified Word Guide, and that that book has words in it similar to a dictionary, but it's not exactly a dictionary. It's a word guide showing you how to use words, what words to use, what words not to use, what words to ask questions about when other people use them so that you can always control what you're saying and have an idea of what you're saying and how best to say it and also understand what other people are saying better. Uh, in a counter-racist fashion. By counter-racist, we mean working against racism and presumably replacing it with a better product, and that better product would be justice. So you go to the computer, producejustice.com, and a brief description of the books will come up and how to order. Okay. Uh, Mr. Fuller, something uh, happened uh, this past week uh, just uh, the other day, and, and it's brought up. I've, I've done a couple of shows on it. I'll probably do one again on uh, today. I'm doing it with you, and I'll do another one at the end of this week and then another one Saturday. Uh, there is this word, uh, gentrification. And I'm sure you've heard of that term. Um, film director Spike Lee, in honor of Black History Month, gave a talk at the Pratt Institute in Brooklyn, New York. This is just recently. Lee denounced the economic and cultural consequences of more and more white people moving into the predominantly black neighborhoods, such as Harlem and Fort Greene, and later received it. And, and, and you know, people uh, looked at this as, as something. But what's happening in a lot of places where black people uh, used to live in large numbers is something called white gentrification and black flight meaning a lot of black people who earn at a certain income level are leaving and then through and then low in so called low income lower income people people who have less income uh are being scattered uh through programs like section 8 and other points and those properties like in Detroit uh like Harlem now even Washington DC uh we just saw data where you live that for the first time in many moons uh, that that city has a majority white population. The same thing is happening uh, in in all over the uh, this area of the world, where you see black folk moving out, white people moving in. Uh, it, it's an incredible transition that's flying almost underneath the radar screen. But the Detroit one is the one that really should catch all of our attention, because now uh, they can come in and buy that land cheap, and, and then at the same time. A white mayor quietly uh, didn't even wasn't even on the ballot. He was a write-in. Quietly moves in <laughs> as the mayor. 
Oh, and we're seeing the same, and it's almost we're being told in Washington, D.C., where you live, that it's being positioned where a white person will become the next mayor of D.C. And the same thing in Harlem and Brooklyn. People who have lived there for years are saying this is not the same neighborhood. We've never seen this before. Ms. Fuller, what's going on here? Well, if you're talking about dislocation of non-white people, that's always been a perennial, uh, meaning perennial meaning an ongoing thing. It never stops. That's always a part of the royalist system of racism. Race, racism itself is a royalist system, which means the kings and queens move in and say, hey, I'm taking over the land from the serfs. I mean, these people out here who are just throwaway people. And so when it's done on the basis of color, it's just racial dislocation. I call it racial dislocation confusion. Uh, there are six different categories that I came up with, racial classification, racial dislocation, racial population tailoring, racial sexual confusion, racial showcase confusion, and racial white sacrifice confusion. So that's just one of the one of the uh, six basic strategies. Keep them moving. Keep them moving because when you de- uh, when you move people, you destabilize them. Uh, that's why people all down through the years, when I was very young, I heard of people who were called gypsies, and they were made fun of. And uh, people said disparaging things about them. They said that they were thieves and whatnot. And any time the gypsies would come to town, I mean, hold down everything that you got. And keep your children away from them, because they'd steal your children. They're just, just nothing but just rampart thieves, uh, people who were called gypsies. And as a very young age, I asked, well, who are gypsies, and where did they come from? What do they do? Well, they're just people that just move around from place to place, because they don't have a home. And they just go from town to town, and they set up fortune-telling booths and whatnot, and they cheat people if you go in there to get your fortune told, because they take your fortune away from you. I mean, while you're in that tent or whatever it is, and then they get out of town before you're aware that they have stolen your wallet or something like that. And it's the same thing with the non-white people throughout the world when it comes to the white supremacists. Keep them moving and make thieves out of them. Because when people are on the move, they, they don't have anything. There's no way to accumulate anything. There's no way to set up that second-generation house. Like in the Northwestern Hemisphere, a lot of non-white people started getting the second-generation house. You would see black people sitting on their porches on a weekend, and uh, people would come by to visit, and they would say, uh, you know, how long have you been in this house, Henry? And they say, oh, I've been in this house since I, I was born in this house, back there in the back room. I mean, we, we had a midwife and whatnot, and uh, this house was passed on to me from my parents and sometimes from grandparents. And so the white supremacists took a look at that, and they said, oh, no, we can't have this. We can't have black people, I mean, raising generations of families in the same house, adding on to the house. Some of them are carpenters and whatnot in the old days, and they add an extra room here, an extra room there. Oh, let's zone them and tell them they got to get zoning permits to start adding on. We're not going to permit that. And then staying in the same house generation after generation? Oh, no. Keep them paying for houses forever. Give them a little matchbox house and run way up on the price and keep that price going up and down and down and up and then guide them over here and guide them over there when the prices come down. And as soon as they get in there, go up on the prices. I mean, and then come in with all Mm -hmm. kind of zoning laws. And you can't do this and you can't do that. And so by the time they get frustrated from that and all like that, well, they say, well, i I, I got to move out of here because it's too costly and whatnot. Mm-hmm. So when they move, then we move in. It's called psycho-racism. Just keep them going in a circle. Move them to the suburbs, so-called, and then run up on the prices and make the transportation impossible for them to get to and from anywhere, to a grocery store, to a job and whatnot. And then so... Then now they got to sell their place and move closer in. So then you go and take up the place that they just moved out of and then improve the transportation. See, just cycle racism. That's all it is. It just constantly keeps going on. Now, I'm going to play, play a little clip uh, from what Spike Lee said as best I can. Now, I want to warn 
uh, some people that Spike Lee does, is not kind on language, so you might hear some cursing. But we're on the uh, um, Internet, so we can, we can let language flow free a little bit more. So I'm just warning you that you might hear some of it. But here's Spike Lee, a little bit of Spike Lee on gentrification. She got tired of paying rent, and she said, said, let's buy a home. My parents, we bought our brownstone in Fort Greene in 1969. You know how much? Forty thousand dollars. You know how I'm, they wouldn't even when they listed they would even list Fort Green back. They would say Brooklyn Heights downtown vicinity. You know how much homes are going to Fort Green? You go to Fort Green today, it's unrecognizable. Bed Stuy, Do or Die, Harlem, Lower East Side, DC's not Chocolate City no more. Here's the thing about gentrification. I've said this more. This won't be the first time people might be hearing this. The upside of gentrification: more police presence. Better public schools. The garbage can be picked up. But there's a downside. I'm not going to make a generalization, but in many cases, when people move in, they have this Christopher Columbus syndrome, which I talked about in Nelson George's film documentary. There's a great tradition and heritage in Harlem, in Fort Greene and Bed Stuy. You just can't come in like blown up the spot like you've been there forever. My father's a jazz musician. A great jazz musician, Bill Lee, did the scores for it. She's Gotta Have It, School Days, Do the Right Thing, Mo Better Blues. He's been playing music at his home, in our home, since 1969. Now, some neighbor moved in. They're calling the cops, my father, saying he's playing his music too loud. That's some bullshit. Mount Morris Park in Harlem. For years, these brothers have played African drums on Sunday morning. Now, they're gone. That's disrespectful. And I'm just using my father's example, but... No one has ever complained since 1969 about my father playing his jazz music. Now this new person moves in, they're calling the cops. The cops laugh at them. That's Bill Lee, it's all right. My father says, they're lucky they moved next door to hear the music. So it's that type of attitude. And, and, and that, that's not making good neighbors. That's not coming to neighbor, hum, you know, being humble. Okay, Mr. Fuller, uh, and I think uh, Spike Lee said quite a bit uh, more, but I just wanted to give a, an example, and I want to read something. Uh, goodness, I had it up here. I wanted to read something that he said so that I could give a, a more clear example of what it is that Spike Lee is talking about. As a matter of fact, I've, I've got it up on the screen now, so I'm going to read a little bit of what uh, Spike said. Uh, he said, um, um, why did it take this great influx of white people to get the schools better? Why is the garbage getting picked up more regular? I mean, and, and then he went on uh, to talk about it, and uh, he laid it out. He talked about schools better, uh, uh, everything, and, and he said that's the good side of it. The bad side is that the people who should have had those services, black people, are being moved out. They can't afford to stay there. So one of the codes is that when you start to see a community improving and getting fixed up, that should be an indication that a whole new group of folk, mostly white, are about to come back into that area to take it over. Mr. Fuller, that's what Spike Lee is saying. Yeah, uh, let me get your thoughts. Well, it's just, like I said, racial dislocation. I mean, that's, that's, that is constant all over the world. I mean, you know, ask the people along the Cherokee Trail many, many years ago, the Indians who were moved out of Alabama and, and Georgia and the Florida and places like that, uh, what they call the so-called five civilized tribes across the Trail of Tears in what they call Oklahoma Territory at that time that was considered wasteland until later on they discovered oil and then here they came again, okay? And they had what they call a run, I mean, where they gave land to white people. I mean, free. That was. They said it was free land, but it was supposed to be Indian land. The term Oklahoma itself means land of the red people, okay? Because they gave that to them because they thought that it was worthless after they had moved them out of Alabama, Georgia, Florida, et cetera, uh, over what they call the Trail of Tears. They called it the Trail of Tears because so many people died along uh, moving from that one place to another. In other words, keep them engines, keep them redskins moving. Don't let them get settled. 
Don't let them set up any kind of place where they're going to be permanent and whatnot, because when people are permanent, they get ideas about growing and how to improve their circumstances. And it's the same way now, all over the world, not just in this area of the world. I mean, you still have your Sowetos and places like that in so-called South Africa and places. And then all over Africa, you see photos of black people, uh, females with their babies in their arms, straggling across the desert territory on account of what you call wars and famines and all like that. Well, any time the shooting starts and all like that, the AK-47s that the white supremacists bring in, and people start slaughtering and whatnot, people are paid to kill other people, one tribe against another, and keep them moving and keep millions of people on the move. And they starve while they're on the move. I mean, they run out of water. They run out of everything because you just can't keep going across what you call, quote, unquote, no man's land with nothing but just what you have on your back or what you can carry or on a donkey or, or in your hand or something like that or on a small cart. And you run out of supplies and you become beggars. Then you become thieves. And that's what they want. That's what they want from black people when they force you out of your house and you have to move a great distance. Now you can't get to your job, so you lose your job on account of when it starts snowing. Now you're cut off. And they say, you're not coming to work. And, hey, old buddy, I mean, you know, I'm trying to help you out, but, I mean, I just can't, you know, keep looking for you and you're not coming in. And uh, just because you live a great distance, I don't have anything to do with that. So I'm going to have to let you go. And so now you, you're just out there and you become, you know, your, your offspring and whatnot coming up. They don't have this. They don't have that. So they start looking around for something to break into. And then now you've built up all of this, finally got a place halfway paid for, but they cut off your transportation. Mm -hmm. All right. They said, oh, well, we're going to reroute these buses now. Well, you say, well, I was depending on the bus route to come right by my house and, and you know, and, and take me to work. Say, well, you got to get a car now. In fact, you got to get three cars because everybody in the house has got to work to pay for that house. So now you can't keep up with your car payments and all like that. They got it very well scientifically figured out. I mean, right down almost to the penny. They know what we're going to be doing 15 years from now, 30 years from now. That's how the white supremacists plan the future of their victims, the non-white people of this planet. Okay. Let's bring in a caller. Caller, you're on air, uh, patiently waiting. We appreciate it. Go ahead. You're on air with Mr. Neely Fuller of Compensatory Concept. Go ahead, caller. Um, I would like Neely Fuller to expound on the um, white supremacist mindset when it comes to non-white individuals' mindset. Okay, say that again where I can uh, kind of get a, a, a gist of, say it again, you want him to expound on how they see how black people think? Is that what you're saying? Correct. 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 Okay. Correct. All right, Mr. Fuller. Well, black people have been trained to think the way that the white supremacists want us to think. So that training is very limited. And basically... It comes down to what is it that black people want more than anything else? That's a very important question because everything, all problems are solved by first asking the correct questions that address whatever the problem is. So you can start with any number of questions, thousands of questions, but uh, the question, what do black people want, is a very important question collectively. The average black person, what does that black person really want, particularly in the Northwestern Hemisphere? What black people really want, because we've kind of been trained that way, uh, sometimes most of us don't even think about it, is that when we get a little leeway to do some thinking of our own and our wants kick in, because everybody wants something from one minute to the next, you want something, but overall, what does the average black person want most? Well, you want to be comfortable enough so that you can pay your bills, et cetera, and have a roof over your head, just the basics, because all organisms want that. But once you get a little bit of that, 
then you want social interaction. Now, what kind of social interaction do black people want? They want it with each other because that's what they're used to. Black people, when they get a little money in their pocket and get some type of wheels under them so they can roll around and a roof over their head and some food in the refrigerator, now that next thing that they want is to contact what? Other black people. Now, here's the important question. Contact other black people for what? Usually it's just to sit around and make small talk. So the white supremacists, directly and indirectly, have provided means by which black people can make small talk all day long. And the small talk among black people usually leads to what you might call uh, trivial conversation. Our conversations usually don't consist of anything that matters, that has any you know, real impact on doing anything constructive, truth be told. Now, the question was, what is the black people's mindset? That's our mindset. It's a very shallow mindset because it means that you're just working and accumulating money and accumulating bling bling and accumulating things, I mean, and things here and things there. Ultimately, so you can go around other black people and make small talk. Stop and think about it. What do we actually do when we get a little time to ourselves? We don't know what to do with ourselves. So what we do is say, well, I got to contact so-and-so. Why? Because I haven't talked to so-and-so uh, in a little while. And then I got to contact so-and-so. And I got to contact so-and-so. And I got to recontact so-and-so. All black people contacting other black people in order to what? Do what? Not to build a huge, better society. Not to come up with greater ideas, but just to sit around like back in slavery time, down by the riverside, making small talk. And when this is all that comes out of your effort of going through all the agony and all of the problems that you that are heaped up on you and all like that, and your only ambition in life is to look up other black people in order to make trivial conversation, truth be told, that's what it is, then that is very shallow for people who are trying to come out of what they call first chattel slavery and then so-called segregation and racism and all the rest of it and set that as a goal for your entire purpose on the planet. And it's got to stop and get a greater goal. So I've recommended what black people do is don't contact each other under any circumstance unless we have something constructive to say, and it had better be over-the-top constructive. And that will be painful for black people because we're not used to it. We're just used to just running our mouths, I mean, blabbing, or, you know, or on the phone or shouting down the road and in the old days and all like that. And uh, being out in the field working hard and whatnot, I mean, it worked then because it was nothing that you could do. I mean, you were much more confined and whatnot, and it's just like prisoners in a small cell. We're in a bigger cell now. But we got to elevate our minds out of that little box of that childish, trivial, small talk, a lot of it among younger people, leading to disaster which is why you have this yellow tape fluttering all over the neighborhood on weekends and sometimes during the week. And a lot of it just comes from small talk that brings about small animosities, that brings about what you call jonoing among young people who pick it up from old people making small talk, talking about nothing that's going to have any monumental consequence in the future or even now. And it's got to stop. Now, it'll be painful, like I said, because that's all we are used to. But it will change a whole people overnight if we become constructive people just in our conversation alone. 
that the word gets out. Black people are not going to talk to you about anything unless it's constructive. And as soon as the constructive conversation ends, they'll say, I'll see you. And they might not see you or talk to you for another three years until they think of something else constructive to say because they are not going to engage in small talk. They are no longer small-minded people. End of that story. Caller, um, want to respond? Uh, that was a great uh, breakdown of the mindset of um, non-white individuals. Um, I have a second question. Um, mm-hmm. Go ahead. Uh, my second question is, um, why do you think that we don't see an array of white people that have money, that are so-called the rich people, um, talk about racism? We tend to hear about regular white people saying, you know, oh, my problem is other white people who are rich, and it's all about money, money, money. But I never really hear like, the Donald Trumps of the world talk about racism. You know, the rich Bill Gates, they don't talk about racism. I just want to know what you think about that. Mm, that's a very good question. Mr. Fuller? You know, oh, well, I, I first want to understand exactly what the question was. I think what he's saying is that whites at a certain level of, econ- of economic wealth or lack of economic wealth talk about racism. But when they reach a level where they've got immense wealth or power, uh, as people perceive it, you know, rich white people, you don't hear him, according to the call, he said they don't talk about racism. They talk about other things, and he wants to know why that is. Am I correct, caller? Absolutely. Okay, go ahead, Mr. Fuller. Well, for one thing, the entire world is under the system of white supremacy when it comes to non-white people. The system of white supremacy in all nine areas of activity, economics, education, entertainment, labor, law, politics, religion, sex, and war. Now, this system was set up a long time ago. Some people say 400 years. Some people say 600 years. Some people say 2,000 years. Other people say 6,000 years. So by any measure, that's a long time to set up a system that dominates and mistreats people based on color. Now, the whole world is under that system. Most of the people on the planet are people who are said in a cliche fashion of color, black, brown, red, yellow, beige, tan, people who have color in their skin. And somebody thought up a system that these people who are classified as non-white are eligible for mistreatment. In other words, look at anybody who has color in their skin, and if you're white, you are supposed to say that you are ordained to dominate and mistreat that person. That's your mission. That's your reason for being. That's your whole reason for being on the planet. Oh, there's a person that has color in his or her skin. Oh, that's a person that's eligible to be mistreated. Mistreated by whom? By me. Uh, Based on what? By me being white. And they being non-white. Well, what is that supposed to be all about? Well, it's an excellent idea. For royalism, meaning I'm always right because I'm white, and they're always wrong even when they're right. They're wrong. Why? Because I say so. And let's set up a whole system worldwide based on that. We do all our business on that. We accumulate money based on that. We accumulate land based on that. We accumulate all the minerals based on that. And then we dictate to these non-white people these throwaway people, because that's what they are. They're worthless. So you just play games with them and throw them away, just like fox hunting or squirrel hunting or something like that. You know, just consider them to be animals, like the person said in the movie Godfather 1. Uh, Sell the drugs to to the coloreds, because they're nothing but animals anyway. Let them lose their souls. That's the basis for the system of white supremacy, and it's worldwide. It was here before any of us was born, and it's very well thought out in detail. So that's a long answer to your question, but I hope that that answers your question. The entire system, there is no other government on the planet other than the system of white supremacy. 
That's the only government that's worthy of the name government. Period. Okay, caller, we appreciate your call. Uh, did that answer your question, sir? Uh, it wasn't really specific towards, uh, like, the, it, I'm pretty sure he, he's seen individuals that are, like, uh, you know, financially well off. But I'm just saying, like, you don't hear, it's not even advertised in the media, or you don't hear them talking about racism. Like, you know, What you're saying is that, is that rich white people do not talk about it, at least in the media. They may talk about it amongst, but they don't. They don't talk about it in the media. Whereas the ones that the whites that do talk about it are not the very rich ones. That's what you're saying. Exactly. That's yeah, what, yeah I just Mr. Fuller. To... That's what he's asking you more specifically. But I tell you what, I want both of you to stay right there. Don't nobody go nowhere. I'm gonna I'm gonna give Mr. Fuller. Uh, we're gonna give Mr. Fuller a chance to respond to that. Just in a second. Stay right there. This is the compensatory concept with Mr. Neely Fuller Jr. Heard exclusively on TalkTainmentRadio.com. I'm Brother Kahari, sitting in every week with Mr. Fuller. Stay right there. More to come. TalkTainmentRadio.com is the premier Internet radio platform offering 40-plus talk radio-style programs professionally produced, optimized for online distribution, featuring Columbus, Ohio on-air personalities. TalkTainmentRadio.com offers listeners diverse programming options covering topics such as arts and culture, love, life, and relationships, technology, religion, paranormal activities, local and national politics, women's issues, alongside health and wellness. Listeners can access their favorite TalkTainmentRadio.com programs free of cost through the website. Download the TTR app to your cell phone and you can take us wherever you go. We have programs on demand to fit your schedule through our podcast. The address is TalkTainmentRadio.com. Hey, Carol, that's your third espresso. What's going on? I've just been to my doctor, and he's ordered lots of tests, blood work, scans, x-rays. Why? Is everything okay? That's just it. I don't really know the whole story. Well, I think the best thing you can do is get more involved in your own health care and get some information. How do I do that? One of the most important things you can do for your health is to ask questions. Be an active and informed member of your health care team. Remember, your health care is about you. For starters, you should ask what condition you're being tested for, how the tests will be done, how soon you'll get the results, and what happens after that. Learn more about what questions to ask about medical tests and other aspects of your health care. Get the brochure, Be Prepared for Medical Appointments. Available at ahrq.gov slash consumer. That's ahrq.gov slash consumer. A message from the U.S. Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. The United Independent Compensatory Code System concept by Neely Fuller is considered as one of the substantial and basic books for understanding and effectively countering racism. Neely Fuller will turn upside down everything you've heard and everything you think you know about racism and how it works. Call area code 202-484-5461. You got the power. This is the Compensatory Concept with Mr. Neely Fuller, Jr., heard exclusively on TalkTainmentRadio.com. Before we get uh, to the – we got another call of waiting also, Mr. Fuller, in addition to the one we have on the line. I wanted to just read a little bit more on this Spike Lee controversy about the gentrification. He says – and I'm not going to use the expletives. I'm not going to use the curse words, he said. But he says uh, when when responding to a question – uh, audience member uh, asked him a question. And then he says, then comes Christopher, comes the Christopher Columbus syndrome. You can't discover this. We've been here talking about white people coming back in under gentrification. You can't discover this. We've been here. You just can't come here in Bogart. There were brothers playing African-American drums in Mount Morris Park for 40 years, and now they can't do it anymore because the new inhabitants said the drums are loud. My father, and he goes on. Uh, some of that you heard. He said when Michael Jackson died, and wanted to have a party for him in Fort Greene, uh, and all of a sudden the white people in Fort Greene said, wait a minute, you can't have black people partying because they'll drop a lot of garbage in the community, et cetera, et cetera. So this this whole gentrification thing is rearing its head again because we are seeing the switch out. We're seeing it in great numbers in Columbus, 
Washington, D.C., Harlem. Detroit, obviously, is set up as the next target. So it's something that we really need to understand. Mr. Fuller calls it racial dislocation. So, But anyway, I just wanted to, to put that on the table. All right, caller, uh, uh, the one that's still on the line, then i got another caller waiting. Uh, go ahead, Mr. Fuller, finish up with what you were saying, and then we have another caller that we're going to take. Go ahead, Mr. Fuller. Yeah, well, the best that I can say is that you have a system of white supremacy in place, and this is to be expected. That's a term I use over and over again. It's to be expected. There's no reason for any white person to talk about racism. Racism doesn't bother them. The victims of racism are bothered about racism. It's just like a prisoner, and victims of racism are prisoners. And just think of it that way. Black people in a prison cell, because we are in a prison cell called the world. In that world, the wardens are the people who are classified as white. That's what the system of white supremacy is about. Now, I don't mean all white people, but I mean those who believe in racism are the dictators to the non-white people of the planet. And the non-white people of the planet are prisoners of war. So when you're a prisoner of war, you are the person who is worried about being a prisoner. But the person who is benefiting from you being a prisoner has no reason to talk about you being a prisoner. There's no reason for them to care. They're not hurting. The white people do not hurt because of racism. Racism does not hurt white people. White supremacy does not hurt white people, except the few white people who are sometimes what you call white sacrifices in order to hold up uh, keep the mob going, you might say. Sometimes mobsters kind of fight among themselves about turf, the turf being wherever the non-white people are. And so they get in arguments with each other. But they usually settle these arguments with a handshake. Mm-hmm. And then they go back to business as usual. Sort of like what we're seeing in the Ukraine. Uh, let's go to my second caller. Caller, you're on the air. Go ahead. Second caller. First caller, stay right there. Second caller, you're on the air. Go ahead. How are you doing, Mr. Fuller? I'm still learning. Go ahead, caller. I have a, um, well, my question is pertaining to um, white supremacy racism and um, the keys to stopping it. I know they're like the biggest government, and you say they're the only form of government. My question is, what are what are the keys to liberation? Is it through edu- education, violence? Like, what, what are the keys? What what should we do? What, what what should a 27-year-old black man in the wilderness of America in this prison, what should I do to liberate myself? I mean, I read a lot, I study a lot, and I listen to shows like this, you know. But I, I was wondering, like, what are the key components to the true liberation of um the black race on planet Earth. Mr. Fuller? You codify everything that you do and say, so that everything that you do and say is, has a constructive effect. That's the key. It's very difficult for people to understand that who are not used to it. And collectively, we're not used to it. We're not used to being constructive because we weren't, we weren't trained or educated to be constructive. We're educated when we are given a little leeway, a a little time to ourselves and whatnot, to do things that don't make sense. So we have become a very pitiful, stupid, and silly people, basically. We, We worship anything that's stupid. We worship anything that's silly. We gravitate toward anything that makes no sense at all. We go looking for each other in order to engage in things that don't make sense. So I I spent about a quarter of this program saying we have to stop these things. But most people, when we even think about it, we say, stop what? Because we're not even aware of what we're doing. Just stop what you're doing. Just look at what you're doing and say, which one of these things really is something that doesn't need to be done, that's not progressive? Anywhere that I'm going, any time of day, that's the key. It's just little simple things. Simple things that we take for granted doesn't have anything to do with with our lives. 
and we have to stop and think about everything that we do and pick out all the things that are non-constructive from the time we get up in the morning to the time we go to bed at night. I mean, the food that we eat and everything. Pick out everything that if you if you can't say look at it and say, now this is constructive, then don't do it. That's the key. But when black people assemble and start talking about we got to do something about our plight, we always talk in slangs and uh, and and things like that. Uh, black power. I mean, and we stomp on the floor, and we beat some drums, and we jump up and down, and we turn around in a circle, and we think that somehow, by magic, Eureka, all kinds of wonderful things are going to happen. And it doesn't work like that. It has to do with what you do each and every day as an individual person. This stuff about black people getting together and, you know, in unity, some type of magical unity that comes from black people when they stand shoulder to shoulder. We even use those terms. Well, black people, in order to get ahead, we got to stand shoulder to shoulder with each other. We were shoulder to shoulder on the slave ship. That's not a formula for anything, standing shoulder to shoulder. Black people need, as individuals, even when there are no other black people anywhere around within a thousand miles, have a code of behavior, things that you do, things that you don't do. And it's very simple. Look at what you're doing at any given moment during the day and ask yourself one question. This thing that I'm doing, is it constructive? or non-constructive, because there's no such thing as in between. It's either going to be one or the other. You're either doing something that makes sense, or you're doing something that doesn't make sense. That's putting it in simple terms. But when I say that to black people, I mean over and over again on the radio and whatnot, they say, what? That's so complicated. I mean, yeah, that ain't sense. no liberation. I mean, when are we going to get liberated? Uh, uh, you know, when are we going to get together? That's another term we use all the time. When are we going to get together? Get together and do what? Well, uh, come up with a plan. A plan to do what? Because a plan has to address the individual person and what that individual person does each and every minute of each and every day. That's it. It isn't anything else. But it's difficult collectively, for black people all over the world, really, to understand that simple principle. Mr. Because we are used to being herded like cows. Mm -hmm. And we think that we don't have power if black people are not really physically all in one place, shoulder to shoulder, with their arms around each other, singing come by ya. And we think that that is some kind of magic from the sky, well, money will just start falling out of the sky when we do that. That's what we actually think. Mr. When it Filler, really comes down to what you do every day. I, I Mr. keep saying that over and over again, but it's a hard sell. Mr. Fuller, let me ask you this, uh, uh, if I can. What evidence do you have or what evidence makes you believe that the strategy that or the, the approach that you're talking about will work any better than the other things that have been done. Why do you believe this will work or this will be effective? Maybe that's a better term. Because we haven't tried it. That's why I believe it, because nothing else has worked. We, we, we have held hands like I don't know what. I mean, we're some of the biggest hand-holding people in the world. I mean, shaking hands, high-fiving. I mean, you know, we are hands, but we are not handsome. We're not handsome people. Handsome means handsome, as old folks used to say, handsome is as handsome does. We don't match our hands with our brains and do something hands-on other than to shake hands. We got di more different kind of handshakes than anybody on earth. But handshaking won't get it. Head shaking won't get it. What will get it is a plan for each individual in every circumstance that you find yourself in. And everybody's in a circumstance each and every day wherever we happen to be. 
and you look around you, wherever you happen to be, and say, now, what is the most constructive thing that I can do? Even in a jail cell. And in the frame in the movie Shawshank Redemption, he said, well, I, I can't go anywhere. I'm in a jail cell. So I'm going to carve rocks. So in carving rocks, he found out a lot about rocks. And in finding out a lot about rocks, he found out that the penitentiary that he was in was made out of inferior material because it was made out of rocks. And that's how he worked his way through that wall with a rock hammer that he had read Morgan Freeman sneak in to him. It took him 20 years to do it, but he had nothing but time because he had two life sentences. So he said, hey, I can tell him my way out of here. And the re reason I can do it is because I figured out by studying rocks right here in this cell, studying rock formations about how I could get out of here and a time frame for doing so. Now, that could imply to every person on the planet, not just black people, but any people who are thinking. Everything starts with a thought. Okay. And you can always think wherever you are. Mr. Fuller, I want to shift a little bit. Uh, this week, and I want callers, I want your comments on it too. This week, we saw uh, 12 Years as a Slave uh, win the best Oscar, the best picture. Mr. Fuller, uh, I don't know if you've had a chance to see it. I've had a chance to see it. I don't know if the two callers had a chance to see it. I'm going to get your thoughts on that, on what this means. Is this a breakthrough? Uh, are, are, are we sanctioned now to discuss slavery? Or is it the continuation of the butler, the help, and now 12 years a slave? What does this mean? How, how do you interpret this, Mr. Fuller, in the annals of, of trying to understand how white supremacy works? Mr. Fuller. I haven't seen the movie. So I'll just wait until I see the movie before I comment on the movie. But I do know a little bit from what I've read and been taught about slavery. And uh, that was just what you call formal chattel slavery. But I have put in my word guide that slavery is nothing but mistreatment, and you don't know what to do about it. And so, therefore, within that frame of reference, with that type of compensatory definition, we're still slaves. Anybody in, on the planet right this minute who's being mistreated, and that person who is being mistreated does not know what to do about the mistreatment, is a slave. End of story. That's going to be the, the new definition or the correct definition, really, for slavery. So you don't put slavery in this box that had to do with just somebody being carried across the ocean in chains and then put on a plantation. Because, like Floyd McKissett of Congress of Racial Equality back in the 1960s, he was talking about slavery once, and uh, he said the slaves weren't freed, they were fired. And so that's another perspective on slavery. The slaves weren't freed, they were fired. And when you think about that, it sounds logical. Follow the logic. I mean, when you're free, you're given something. In other words, you, you are able to sustain yourself now where you wasn't able to do it before. But when they turn people loose on the plantation, I mean, where did they go? And who was going to support them? So they wound up under what they call, in the Northwestern Hemisphere, a thing called segregation, which is just another way of saying is just another form of slavery because you're still being mistreated based on color. All you have to really remember about the word slavery is, are you being mistreated? That's first question. Second question, do you know what to do about the mistreatment? And if the answer is no, then you're still a slave. Okay. Um, callers, did you have any other comments or thoughts that you wanted to add, things that you wanted to say to Mr. Fuller? Um, um, yes, I have um, just one more question. Yes, quickly. Yes, sir. Um, Mr. Fuller, I, um, I understand what you're saying as far as doing things constructive every day on an everyday basis. My question to you is, is basically what you're saying,
saying? It's just be adaptable to every situation and every circumstance and never stop learning. Always study, read, study history, war, politics, and um, economic things within that nature. Yes, and, and more than anything, look at what's going on around you and pick out the things that are constructive and the things that are not constructive. That's one of the most difficult things from what I'm hearing from a lot of black people when I talk to them. That's one of the most difficult things for us to think about, even to think on that level. Just do that one simple thing. Every day you're looking at things going on around you, wherever you happen to be. You're looking at things going on around you. You're looking at people passing by. Ask yourself, where are these people going? And what are they going to do when they get where they are going? Right, See, pay right. attention to details. And if necessary, just follow somebody without looking like you're getting ready to rob them, of course. I mean, and see what the person does, where the person goes. Look at what you do. Where do you go? And what do you do when you get where you're going? People are always coming and going all the time, busloads of people, people in cars, I mean, uh, pulling up to the stoplight. They're on their way somewhere. What are they doing? And last but not least, see, most of the things that people do are things that they have to do, like go to work. They're trying to get to work. A lot of people in cars, bumper to bumper, are trying to get to work. Or they're trying to get from work so that they can do other things. Now, look at the other things that they do. And then add all of that up and say, what did you do yesterday? Add up everything that you did yesterday and see how many things were constructive and how many things were non-constructive. Because, like I said, there's no such thing as in between. It's going to fall in one of those two categories. Right now, there's some black person who is putting a 9 millimeter automatic pistol in his or her pocket or belt and whatnot, a knapsack, and fixing to hit the streets. Now, you're carrying that 9 millimeter pistol for what? For what constructive purpose? If you ever use it, is it going to be for a constructive purpose or for a non-constructive purpose? Because you're carrying it. And the average person that's carrying a gun, sooner or later, in most cases, not in all, but sooner or later is going to use it. And is it going to be for a constructive purpose or a non-constructive purpose? If you're going into the liquor store, that's an action. I'm going into the liquor store. Hey, man, I'm going across the street to the liquor store. You're going into the liquor store for what purpose? Why are you going into the liquor store? You're going in there to get a lottery ticket? Okay. That's one purpose. Is that purpose constructive? Just answer that question yourself, depending on how much you're going to spend and how much it's going to hurt. If you spend too much, how much is too much? Only you know that. Or are you going to buy a bottle of liquor? If you buy a bottle of liquor, whom are you buying it for? In order to do what? What does liquor do? What does a bottle of vodka do when you drink it? Guggle it down. Sit there on the curb. Does it have a constructive effect or a non-constructive effect? It's not difficult. It's not rocket science. Every move that you make, every move that I make, like talking on this phone, am I having a constructive effect or a non-constructive effect? I have to measure that. And I do. When I get off of this phone, I will think about two things, because I have a little chart here that I keep for myself. Clarity and focus. Was I clear in what I said, and did I keep my focus? Because these are two things, as a black person, that's very easy to lose. That's focus on what you're trying to do and clarity in doing it. I grade myself. and I have never been above, out of four stars, I do the old, what you call, movie system. I've never been above two and a half stars. That's grading myself because I have to be honest with myself. I've never made a talk 
on a radio program or anything that was above two and a half stars. Never. Because I've never been absolutely clear, and I've never kept absolute focus. And when you grade yourself so you can be honest, if you want to be honest, because that's who you should grade before you start grading anybody. Grade yourself on everything. Okay, callers, thank you. Mr. Fuller, um, let's get into some closing comments. Anything that came up this week that you might want to talk about, sir? Well, one one of the things I covered already, and that was the unity thing. Mm -hmm. But I always want to keep in mind, what is it we're supposed to be aiming for ultimately? And that is quality relationships. Mm -hmm. And I mentioned that all through this program today. I hope I, I keep emphasizing that. And that is every relationship, every time you interact with somebody, whether it's white or non-white, try to make that interaction constructive. Ask yourself, even while you're talking to someone, is this conversation constructive? Because if it isn't, it's time to stop that conversation. It's time to say, well, I have to go now. Uh, I have something else to do, and I will see you later. later. I will talk to you some other time. And uh, break off the conversation if the conversation is leading to something non-constructive. Because a lot of what we do throughout the day has to do with conversation. Conversation is how we learn things. Always try to learn something constructive in every conversation that you have. Either you're telling somebody that's going to have something that's going to have a constructive effect, or someone is telling you something that's going to have a constructive effect. And you know what's constructive after you try it a little bit or really think about it and keep asking yourself that question. Constructive, non-constructive. Constructive, non-constructive. Constructive, non-constructive. Sometimes we just have to repeat the same things to ourselves over and over and over again because that's how basically we learn because that's how we've been taught to learn, by rote. And so we can teach ourselves. We can train ourselves rather than wait to be trained, like the white supremacists will always train us like they train their dogs, which is how they treat us like dogs. Or worse, they treat their dogs better than they treat non-white people. Truth be told, many of them, you're talking about leading a dog's life. A lot of people in the system of white supremacy, particularly white people, really think more of their dogs than they think of any black person that ever lived. And they'll practically tell you that if they'll tell you the truth. Some of them who are listening to this program right now might chuckle at that one because they know it's true. I had a cousin that got out of the military, and he went back to Arkansas, which is where he was from. And while he was still wearing his uniform, he walked up to someone because he was glad to be back from World War II in the South Pacific, I mean, fighting for, quote, unquote, democracy. And so he just asked one of the local people, a white man, he said, well, how are things? And he said, same thing, white man first, dog next, Negro last, only he didn't say Negro. <laughs> okay, well, Mr. Fuller, um, it's it's really dynamic. Uh, because, as you know, and we've got about a minute left, we don't have, we're not, a, increasingly, these conversations are not being held or not being had. Uh, and increasingly, this ability to talk about these things is being shut down. Ms. Fuller, let me, for, I've got about 30 seconds, let me get you a quick comment on what's happening with our ability to talk about these things. Oh, well, that's never been our priority. Our priority has been to talk random with each other, just like I spent about a quarter of this this day talking about. What do black people talk about when they're among themselves? Most black males, I mean, wearing our jerseys and whatnot of our favorite football star, we'll talk about some type of sports. Then we'll hit on the weather, and then we will start touching on something dealing with sex or something like that, and not a conversation just runs out. We don't know where, know where to go from there. Wow. And that's why a lot of what you call industrious-type white people don't like to talk to black people about anything. Because they say, for one thing, their conversation doesn't consist of anything that's worth hearing. Wow. Mr. Fuller, thank you so much. We appreciate you always. We'll talk with you next week. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me.
Thanks for listening to The Compensatory Concept with Mr. Neely Fuller, heard exclusively on TalkTainmentRadio.com.